The Night Beat starts right now. There are his high school colors. Sky 12 tonight over the frost tower. The gold and crimson lights meant to honor George Floyd the night before his funeral in Houston tomorrow. San Antonio joining other cities around the nation for this memorial. As you see there, Frost Bank lit up in crimson and gold, representing Houston's Jack Yates High School, where Floyd graduated. The Alamo Dome dedicating a sign to George Floyd tonight as well. The Henry B. Gonzalez Convention Center and the rental car facility at the airport also lit up in crimson and gold tonight. And the Tower of Americas also joining in this effort. Here is the view of the Tower of the Americas from below. The calls for justice continue day 10 of protests in the city of San Antonio happening downtown this evening. Organizers holding the event to memorialize George Floyd and others who have died to police brutality in our nation. The night team's Jaffney Gray was with protesters throughout the evening. She has more on their message for change. Jaffney. Yes, guys, it was a long and hot day of peaceful protest right here in downtown. People marched silently with their fists held high in the air in solidarity until they reached right here in Hemisphere Park, where which about an hour ago was packed with people just sitting on the ground sharing their stories. Now, after speaking with several of those protesters, I learned they participated for similar but different reasons, but all standing for justice. Love. People are, are fed up. Progression. Class act. These are just a few of the ways people describe the protests they've seen and participated in in honor of George Floyd and the fight against racism. You can't say liberty and justice for all and then say that some people don't matter. And the fight against police brutality. That passion needs to turn into voting and putting pressure on elected officials to make the changes at the city level, the state level, and the federal level so that what happened to George Floyd never happens again. During the peaceful protest and silent march today, many speakers were present. Hundreds came out with their own motivations. Until the systemic racism is solved, we're going to keep fighting. The energy and enthusiasm and, and effort that the people are putting into these protests, I want to see it come to concrete change. Change that has different meanings to different people. True equality, because we don't have that. And that's what we're here for. To rebuild the trust that the police department has. Before there's any kind of policy reform, there has to be heart reform. reform. Protesters made their way from Blue Star Arts Complex through La Vieta to the final stop at Hemisphere. They say they hope the message behind their protests inspires the next generation as this time plays a pivotal part in history. You have a voice, you need to be heard, you need to be seen, your presence needs to be felt, and there is power in numbers. If there's something that matters to you in your community, you can change it if you show up. Hear people first before you see them. Don't ever stop fighting, because once we stop and get complacent, we're going to have everything all over again. Organizers and protesters tell me that they will continue to protest until that change is made. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jaffney. There have been calls to reopen three deadly officer-involved shooting cases in Bear County, but District Attorney Gonzalez says his office does not plan to reopen cases involving Marquise Jones, Tr Antroni Scott, and Charles Roundtree. Jones was shot and killed by an officer in 2014 after the car he was riding in rear-ended another car at a Chacho's drive through The officer said he fired because Jones had a gun. He was later cleared of any wrongdoing. Charles Roundtree was fatally shot at a home in 2018. The officer fired at Roundtree when another person reached for a gun. A grand jury declined to indict the officer. And Antroni Scott was shot and killed in 2016 during a traffic stop. The officer in that case mistook a cell phone in Scott's hand for a weapon and was suspended indefinitely. The decision was reversed days later and the officer was ordered to undergo training. While some are protesting, one man is painting. The short, short message you see here is a powerful one. Enough is enough. This is the same artist behind other popular works like the Cardi B mural that was updated with a mask amid the pandemic. Colton Valentine has placed a timely message in the latest mural on the same wall near San Pedro in Cyprus. Today we spoke with him about his artistic role in the push to end racism. That was the very first time I was like, just astonished. Colton Valentine is an experienced artist. 
He's also had firsthand experiences when it comes to racism. I'm predominantly Puerto Rican. When I grow my hair out, I can grow an afro. Like my hair doesn't grow, like it grows into a full flesh afro. It was at a skate park when a teenager targeted him for his features. He called me the N-word and to get the F out of here, go back where I belong. And ever since then, at 15, I was like, okay, some people treat you a little differently based off of what you look like. It's why he says it was important for him to be part of the fight towards change. He worked on this mural described as a chorus of voices, a range of skin tones all saying the same three words, enough is enough. So the, they notice all the different browns and so they're like, all right, I get what you're doing. The artwork follows the death of George Floyd, killed while in police custody in Minneapolis. The mural's message of unity is reflected by the teamwork that made it all happen. Retail store SA Flavor put up the money for materials and linked Valentine with an artist more than 1,000 miles away in Durham, North Carolina. Brandy Chieco came up with the design. Tonight, she released a statement saying in part, quote, together is the only way forward. I'm so grateful to Colton for his incredible work and for being a partner in spreading the word. Along with the mural, Valentine added a call to action, a list of resources in the fight against racism. A list of places you can go to actually donate and also get educated on how we can help. Included in that list, an encouragement to vote. If you get involved with the local community, the local politics, um, that's where things really change. Valentine says he plans to keep the mural up for a while and is encouraged by the thought that change will happen. A reminder, runoff elections will be held next month. Voters will have until June 15th to register to vote. There's still time. That's one week from today. You can check if you're registered by heading to votetexas.gov. The Bear County Elections Office can help with, their, with that information. Their number, 210-335-VOTE. New tonight, children at home as a shooting takes place. Police say none of the three children inside the home were injured, but there is an investigation tonight. It happened near Loop 410 and Starcrest. Witnesses say a woman was home visiting her children with an ex-boyfriend when the children's father, the ex-husband, rushed into the home. Police say the ex-boyfriend shot the ex-husband. Both ran from the scene. The man who was shot was found at a hospital with a gunshot wound to the groin. Police are hoping to speak with the suspected shooter. A family found dead now identified. Joint Base San Antonio also releasing some background on the military man involved. The Bear County Medical Examiner has identified the couple as 38-year-old Jared Harless and 36-year-old Cheryl Ann Harless. Their children also identified and ranging in age from four years old to just 11 months. Police say they died of carbon monoxide poisoning. However, the cause and manner has not been officially determined. Today, JBSA revealing Jared Harless was from Renton, Washington. He had been with the United States Army since 2010 and had one deployment to Iraq in 2011. New on the night beat more than 6,500 likes and shares help a local veteran get his wheels back. The 91 year old man says he enjoys the peace and freedom of a daily bike ride. The night team's Patty Santos tells us what happened when someone took that from him. I ride it every day. At 91 years old, Herman Golick still gets his daily exercise. And I've been riding a bike. When when I was in military service, I was stationed at Randolph. In fact, he still makes weekly trips there. I enjoy it. Give me a little exercise. I even go at times to Randolph Air Force Base, the credit union and shopping. He was in the Air Force before it was called the Air Force. His family tells us Golic served 20 years, including World War II and the Korean War. The bike to him is everything. It kind of gives him a little freedom, and he can do it when he wants to do it. But this weekend, a thief struck. My aunt messaged me and said that my grandfather's bike was stolen. The family quickly flooded social media for help finding it. Immediately, I got tons of messages. Luckily, his bike was not far away. A late, nice lady messaged me saying that I think I may have your bike and it happened that somebody had sold it to them. In just hours, Golic and his bike were back in business. Welcome back. <laughs>
No, I missed it very much. No word from Universal City Police on a suspect information or an arrest. A bicycle that was gifted to Golic by a business will be donated to a veterans organization. Patty Santos, Case at 12 News. I'm glad Herman got his bike back. Yes. Yes, absolutely. That was good. And that's good exercise mm -hmm. for him. Very good exercise. 97. That was our high temperature today after a low of 75. Obviously no rainfall. We hardly even had any clouds in the sky, but it's going to get even hotter tomorrow. We're still feeling the warmth out there. I mean, it's 89 at the airport in town, 89 in Castroville, Stinson 85, Divine 88, as low as 82 and 83 as you get in parts of the hill country. So tomorrow morning, we'll wake up to temperatures in the upper 70s. A mixture of sun and clouds and very muggy conditions. It's going to be not only humid, but hot. And that's going to put us in heat advisory territory as we get into tomorrow afternoon. I'll talk more about this and then the big changes for the remainder of the week coming up. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat, the San Antonio Board of Realtors responding to a program that highlighted San Antonio's housing market. Why they say they want to get the facts out coming up. And in our KSAT Q&A, we invite the owner of J12 Designs. It's a minority-owned web design company and how he's demanding change during this time. And we get an update on the coronavirus cases in Bear County. That's next on the Night Beat. Tomorrow on GMSA, some important news for grandparents taking care of their grandkids during the pandemic. I'm Sarah Acosta. We'll have some ways to keep you safe. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather streaming free on KSAT TV. Let's take a look at the latest numbers of COVID-19 in Bear County. We now have 3,333 cases confirmed. More than 2,000 people have now recovered from the illness, leaving 1,163 people still fighting the disease. 96 of those people are in the hospital tonight. The number of deaths remains at 78. Focus on the statistics. That's what the San Antonio Board of Realtors says it wants to get across following a 60 Minutes episode that highlighted San Antonio and the pandemic last night. We just really want to make sure that we get the facts out there because the market is much stronger than uh, perhaps um, it came across. Kimberly Bragman is the San Antonio Board of Realtors 2020 chairwoman of the board. She says Texas is doing relatively well compared to other states when it comes to the housing market. And when it comes to San Antonio, Bragman says through the end of May, they are seeing the same number of units sold when compared to the same time last year. Bragman says the housing market did feel the impact of COVID-19, but is on a positive trend. I would say March was a little bit tough. You know, we went into lockdown pretty much in the middle of March. And so uh, the rest of the month was a little tough. Um, April was a little tough as well. Uh, but we're really seeing things starting to pick up, especially because interest rates are so low. And so a consumer's buying power is much stronger than uh, it would have been this same time last year when interest rates were higher. Bragman says the city's strong military presence and the growth of businesses has helped San Antonio weather the storm. Today was the first day of free antibody testing for COVID-19 at the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center. As a thank you, the center offering this type of testing to its blood donors, South Texas Blood and Tissue Center COO Elizabeth Waltman says they have already seen an increase in blood donations. Just today, there were 494 appointments scheduled. It's a good service in both directions, you know, to be able to have the test and contribute something. It's such an invisible disease, and I think we're all somewhat concerned if we've had it or haven't had it. And then if you've had it, maybe they can use your antibodies to help other people. Those at the Blood and Tissue Center remind you that you should only donate if you're healthy. If you are feeling sick, you can reschedule your blood donation. The center will actually be offering this free testing until August 31st. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention reminding the public to not hold off seeking emergency care if you need it. The CDC says the number of emergency room visits this year is 42% lower than this time last year. It's something we've actually been documenting here on KSAT. Last year, decreases are highest among children. Excuse me, this year decreases are highest among children ages 14 and younger, women and girls, and people in the Northeast. 
The data was taken from hospitals in about 47 states and only accounts for ER visits. It doesn't account for people who may have sought treatment elsewhere. Well, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services is running low on remdesivir. It's a drug that has been used to help with COVID-19. The last shipment is set to go out at the end of the month. Gilead Sciences, the company that makes the drug, says it's ramping up production and hopes to have more this summer. Remdesivir has helped reduce the number of days COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. Take a live look outside with live cam tonight. Still 89 degrees out there as we look towards downtown San Antonio. And I did I hear that places not far from here are going to reach like 112 tomorrow? Well, that, that's just the heat index. OK, that's right. not air temperature. Big difference there. Uh, so the heat index could get that high in some locations tomorrow. So we'll talk about that in a minute. But overall, just a hot and humid Tuesday. Then we get an extended break from the humidity. So if you don't like the humidity, it gets swept away and really it's kept away for several days. And that's going to lead to some pleasant mornings as well, where temperatures will actually be running quite a bit below average. So let's get right to it. Take a look at first our high temperatures today, and we had one record breaker out there. That was Del Rio at 107, breaking the old record by three degrees. 101 Pleasanton, Catula topped out at 105. And Uvalde right at the century mark. You look at temperatures right now and well, we're in the 80s and 90s, 90s in the warmer locations off to the west. Del Rio still 96 degrees at 10 19 p.m. 92 in Catula. Meanwhile, 84 New Braunfels and 81 in Kerrville. And for the most part, we'll drop down into the upper 70s by early tomorrow morning. Here's the forecast for around sunrise in the morning. We're thinking about 78 here in San Antonio and a few degrees cooler as you get into the hill country, but then you fast forward into tomorrow afternoon and we do think tomorrow really could clock in as our first 100 degree days. We're forecasting 100 even for the air temperature here in town. Obviously a bit warmer as you get farther west and southwest of San Antonio. However, the key is it's not just the heat, but the humidity, of course. And when you factor in that humidity, which is pretty high, it's going to make it feel like it's anywhere from 105 to 112. Now that's basically along and east of I-35. So all these counties in orange here, including Bear County and neighboring Medina County and points eastward, that's where we have the heat advisory. Now I think most of us will probably see heat indices between about 105 and 109, but there could be a few isolated spots in the afternoon tomorrow with them as high as 110 to 112. And we just look at these dew points. 75 degrees in Gonzales, 78 Pleasanton. This is extremely sticky air. It doesn't stretch all the way westward, but still we're feeling it. And this is one of the reasons why that advisory especially encompasses areas east of I-35 because of the higher dew points. Now, a, a cold front technically, but I'm going to call it a not as humid front will be moving through tomorrow afternoon and tomorrow evening. So behind it, look at Wednesday through the weekend a big lack of humidity in the air. So big changes, very noticeable changes for the middle part of the week all the way through the upcoming weekend. All right, here's the cold front or not as humid front that's moving in and it's going to drop temperatures a little bit too, but the main effect will be the lack of humidity. Now as this front drops in, there is the chance of a rogue shower or storm. 7 a.m., some clouds out there a sunny afternoon at the noon hour. Then we'll see some clouds starting to develop into the afternoon as that cool front drops in. And with it, yeah, one or two pop up showers or thunderstorms. And if a storm does happen to, to develop tomorrow, there is the off chance that it could become strong to severe. And don't really hold much stock in the exact locations that the future cast is showing. It could really pop up anywhere along this front, especially along the 35 corridor and east of I-35. So there's that off chance. We're giving it about a 20% chance of a storm popping up. So sunny, hazy, hot, humid tomorrow. Right around 100 for the air temperature, but factoring in the humidity in the afternoon for a handful of hours, it'll feel like it's anywhere from 104 to 109, I think, here in San Antonio, and that 20% chance of rain. Then we get rid of the humidity Wednesday through the upcoming weekend and even into early next week. This is an abnormally long stretch 
where we don't have humidity in June. You're not going to notice that that real muggy weather and temperatures for highs will be in the mid 90s for the most part. Bright and sunny, not even a shot or a glimmer of hope for any rain beyond that 20% chance tomorrow afternoon. But here's the key with that drier air mornings in the 60s and running quite a bit below average then. Let's just get through Very tomorrow. Nice, yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Adam. All right, the Spurs revealing an injury that isn't all that new. No, you're talking about LaMarcus Aldridge undergoing surgery. The surgery actually happened back in April. We're finding out about it today. That means his season is over. What type of surgery did, his, did he have? How long will it take him to recover? We'll let you know. And welcome back to all the high school student athletes from the UIL coming up. When the Spurs resume their season late next month, they will do so without LaMarcus Aldridge. Today, the Spurs announced his seven-time All-Star underwent arthroscopic surgery on his right shoulder. Aldridge originally injured his shoulder while at Utah back on February 21st, but continued to play on the road trip against the Oklahoma City Thunder on February 23rd. It was after that game he took off the next six, only to return to score 24 points against the Dallas Mavericks on March the 10th, just one day before the NBA season was suspended due to the coronavirus. The surgery was actually done in Dallas on April the 24th, with the Spurs waiting until today to release the information since the season is set to resume at Disney World in the 22-team format that the Spurs will be part of. Spurs general manager Brian Wright meeting with the media today via Zoom just minutes after the announcement was made. We tried to, you know, take advantage of the hiatus period um, with rehab and, and him working to, to get back. And unfortunately, it just didn't progress the way that we all had hoped. Um, and the best pathway from there was the surgical procedure. So uh, we decided to move forward with that and get him ready um, for next season. Here's what Marcus had to say through the team. Disappointed I won't get to finish the season with my teammates, but excited that I'll be fully ready to go next season and beyond. Today is today. All high school student athletes under the umbrella of the University Interscholastics League are allowed back on campus. Such was the case for the Johnson Jaguars football team, who held their first workout since all high school sports were shut down during the Boers State High School basketball tournament in the Alamo Dome back in March. And for Mark Soto, it's the first time he has seen his players on the field since he was named the Jags' new coach back in April. Soto replaces Ron Riddleman, who left Johnson after 12 years to move to Alamo Heights to become the new athletic director and head coach of the Mules. I mean, it's, a, it's been a long time coming, man. It's like Christmas morning for us, so we're, we're excited to get out here and see the guys. You know, I've been on the job now, uh, what, six weeks and really haven't met the kids face to face besides Zoom meetings. So for, for us here at Johnson, it's a pretty special day. I think it's important for them. You know, we're, we're social beings. We like to be around people. You know, they're, 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 they're good friends. They're really good friends. So uh, for them to be out here and be able to see each other working side by side instead of working out of their garage or, or meeting up at the park is pretty important for them. And uh, we're just kind of taking it slow, making sure that we don't, you know, shock the body too bad and, and, and kind of get them assimilated back into working out and being out in the sun. All right, now this was a scene out at Somerset High School today where we can see the Bulldog staff taking their players' temperatures before their voluntary workouts. That includes no more than two hours Monday through Friday, an additional 90 minutes for sports-specific instruction. One staff member for 10 players, and if they're working out, they must maintain a distance of 10 feet. If not, six feet will do. For the parents, I mean, we, I've had a whole bunch of phone calls this week just say, hey, coach, are we ended up having this. Are we going to do it? And uh, we're all fired up. Yeah, we're, we're at it going. Uh, going. Uh, I know that our athletic directors, we uh, spoke about it around the state, and the, the safety of the kids is the main thing. Uh, we do, yes, we want to get back to athletics, but the safety of our kids are the main thing. we got about 100 kids that are lined up, ready to end up going. They've been sitting at home, and they're, they're ready to get out and work. Uh, likewise, here in San Antonio, the Lanier Volks are on the field today for the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic shut down high school sports in March. There must be separate entry and exit passages for the players. No use of the locker rooms or showers. Players must come dressed from home and equipment must be wiped down at the end of each session and after the end of each use. But the Volks were focused more on general exercise for the first day of practice. We're trying to get them back in shape a little bit and uh, we're not using the weight room yet because we don't want to use spotters yet, and for, for most lifts you need a spotters. But we we, we have some bar uh, some bars out here. They weigh 45 pounds, and for some of them, this is the first time they've touched a weight since first of March. So we're just getting trying to get them reacquainted. 
The Texas private and parochial schools were allowed to begin workouts last Monday, the day the UIL gave the green light under the umbrella in the state of Texas. New proposal for Major League Baseball next. There is new hope that Major League Baseball will start up their season after all after a new proposal was floated by the team owners today that includes a 76-game schedule. That's still less than the 114-game proposal by the Major League Baseball Players Association. But what makes this one more attractive is about the money the players would be paid. According to ESPN, the 76-game schedule would include the players receiving 75% of their prorated salaries and would include a $200 million postseason pool for the players. Under the 76-game plan, the season would end no later than October 31st playoffs would begin with just 10 teams. This is much closer to what the players had been proposing earlier, so hopefully they can get this work out. They need to get it done. At the same time, my big fear is that minor league baseball, specifically our San Antonio missions, that window is closing rapidly. Yeah. It's a sad situation for a lot of ball ball clubs. You got it. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Hey, coming up, our case at QA next. We're gonna speak with business owner James Lewis and his experience amid the fight against racism coming up. I saw a sign this weekend that said, observe lessons with your eyes and not your mouth. I saw it as a reminder to be as good a listener as you are a speaker, and that's kind of the idea behind KSAT Q&A. Of course, separating the facts from the fear that are out there, but also listen to the answers and watch for lessons. Our guest tonight is here to share his experience as a minority business owner, but also just his life experiences. James Lewis runs J12 Web Design. They do a lot of different websites, as you've probably seen, including, I should mention, the Bear Facts website, and that's how James and I got to know each other. Thanks for staying up late with us, James. I appreciate it. When we talk, yeah, thanks about, for me. When we talk about life experiences uh, amid calls for justice and calls for end of racism, what comes to your mind? Gosh, you know, when it comes to just end of racism and, you know, it's there's so many things you can really talk about. Uh, I would start with the fact that there's a lot of hard conversations uh, that we need to have. And one of the good things that's coming out of is of this is that there are a lot more conversation, like you just mentioned, a lot more listening. So people of uh, color get to share their experiences and everyone else can say, wow, I had no idea it was like that for you. You know, there's certain conversations my dad had with me and maybe uh, other fathers didn't have with their sons. But now we get to really talk about it and people can see uh, what it's like on, on the other side. Now, Mr. Lewis, as you've been watching the events of the past few weeks, this, this truly is a moment in history. What does this moment mean for you personally? As personally, you know, th this moment of time, and, and I, I truly believe that this change is, is going to come it, and it's not going to be something this quick. Okay. It, and it's going to be, it's going to take some time, but for me, I'm excited about all races coming together again, having more conversation. Uh, like I said, a few minutes ago, there are certain, uh, topics that are being discussed now that we really weren't talking about. And it's not like things like this haven't happened before, but now everybody's coming together. You've seen what's happened at Travis Park. It's not just black people protesting. It's people of all races coming together and saying, what can we do to change this? So for me, it's a great moment to be a part of this, this shift is about to happen. But again, it's not gonna be something that's gonna be quick. It's gonna take some time. Yeah, we can learn from each other. And, I, and that's what it, you talked about conversations that your father had with you. You talked about, you know, a, even like interactions with police. I, explain to me what that conversation was. Uh, so maybe people can understand a little bit better, you know, uh, where you're coming from. Yeah, you, you know, um, I, I, I'll tell you a quick story of last time I was pulled over. Um, I was going a little bit over the speed limit in a, in a 35. And uh, I was coming from playing basketball, but I had my wallet in my backpack. So as I was being pulled over, of course, I'm going through my checklist of what to do. Okay. Keep my hands 10 and two on the steering wheel, make sure I got my insurance out. And I was like, Oh, my wallet's in my bag, which is in the back. So I told the officer where my wallet is. And I said, you know, can I please get it? 
And as I walk uh, towards the back to get it out, I noticed that his hand was on his gun. He didn't have it pulled out, but his hand was on it, just ready, just in case. So here I am in my mind thinking, all right, don't make any sudden movements. Everything's slow. Um, you know, I'm, I'm trying my best to stay calm. And in my head, I just want to make it home to my wife and kids. And he's probably thinking, I just want to make it home to my wife and kids. So when we get pulled over, there's a lot more, uh, there's a lot of things going through our heads uh, that we have to think about just to make th- make sure everything is cool. So conversations like that about what to do when you get pulled over, what to do when you walk into a store, make sure you get receipts. Even to this day, when I walk out the Apple store, I want a bag. <laughs> I'm not just walking out the store with anything without a receipt in a bag. So that's just some of the conversations that we have. Mr. Lewis, I want to ask you a little bit about being a business owner. You mentioned during our six o'clock interview with you that um, most or if not all of your employees are minorities. Do you believe it's important important for businesses, both large and small, to recruit minorities into the fold? Yes, uh, because diversity is just not something that you can just you know, just check off the box just because. Uh, there's a lot of things that you can bring to your company. Uh, I'll give you one example. We've all used uh, the soap dispensers, right? And when those were just being built where you just put your hand under the dispenser and it, and it puts the soap out, well, some companies didn't have a lot of people of color in their business to not only for testing, but for them to say, hey, we may want to do some testing to see if our sensors pick up on darker skin. That's just a quick, like small example of what having a a diverse environment can do for your business. There's tons of other perspectives and point of views that you don't even think about that people of uh, other other cultures can teach you. San Antonio prides itself on being a diverse community, you know, a community, you know, of many different to become one. I mean, do you agree with that? And do you have some things that you would like to see change locally? Locally, and well, let me go back to, you know, your comment about uh, us being diverse. I mean, I I agree with that. I mean, look, uh, this city uh, has a little bit of everything. I mean, uh, of course, we have a a larger uh, Hispanic community. Uh, You can go somewhere and it doesn't feel like, all right, uh, I'm just around uh, certain people. You can you can travel around town and get a little bit of everything. Now, as far as what I want to see change, the only thing I want to see change is really um, some of the laws that we have in place for our own law enforcement, which I want to say I, I grew up on the east side. I know how difficult it is uh, for law enforcement and first responders. But it not only having a conversation, but also us educating ourselves to look and see what policies are in place. That's one change I, w- I would like to see, just a lot of a lot more education amongst ourselves, knowing what laws are in place and what laws need to be in place. And finally, Mr. Lewis, you know, as a business owner, as a member of this community, as a person of color, what are some final thoughts that you would like our viewers to know? Just know that um, we are not anti-police. This is not who we are. Um, we just want accountability. And let's not get distracted from that, okay? I mean, the riots, uh, the protesting is great, okay? You have people who may riot or think about rioting, and you got looters who are just causing trouble. Well, let, let's not let the looting and the riots take uh, distract us and take our attention away from the bigger issue, which is accountability, making sure that those people in power don't abuse it. That way, when we do break the law or if something happens, Let's be tried in the courtroom rather than on the streets. James Lewis, appreciate your time tonight. J12 Designs, uh, you know, I'll see you, what, in a couple weeks or so when we get the new bear facts pull out and, you know, you know, you'll be you'll be uh, not smiling then because you have a lot of work to do. (laughs) I I appreciate I, I, I appreciate your help, James. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll be right back. George Floyd's family preparing for his private funeral tomorrow. Today, thousands of mourners paying their respects outside a church in Houston. Floyd's death now sparking a nationwide debate about policing, and President Trump weighs in. ABC's Alex Prashay has more from Washington. 
Two weeks after his death, George Floyd celebrated by his hometown of Houston. Thousands of mourners braving 90 degree Texas heat to pay their respects. I'm passionate about justice, equality, fairness, rightfulness, brotherhood, sisterhood, unity. Those mourners linked by a city and a cry for change. This man whose death has changed the world, he's changed the world. You have to come. You know, you, you have to. I can't explain it. Inside the church, social distancing, just 15 people at a time in masks and gloves. Earlier in the day, former Vice President Joe Biden met with Floyd's family privately for more than an hour. A family attorney tweeting, he listened, heard their pain and shared their woe. The Floyd family, grateful for this outpouring, but all of this was happening as fired Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was making his first court appearance. Appearing by remote in an orange jumpsuit and a blue face mask, prosecutors laying out the second degree murder case, the judge setting bail at one and a quarter million dollars. And now with more scrutiny of police departments across the country, there's a growing call to outright abolish or defund police departments in some areas, diverting some police funds to other social programs. The Minneapolis City Council announcing it intends to dismantle its department. The mayor announcing a new coalition to provide more economic inclusion for people of color. Other cities also putting together plans to partially defund the police. New York City shifting some NYPD funds to youth programs. LA planning to cut as much as $150 million from its police budget. President Trump says it's not going to happen. There won't be defunding. There won't be uh, dismantling of our police. We're going to talk about ideas how we can do it better and how we can do it, if possible, in a much more gentle fashion. Alex Perche, ABC News, happen. Houston. And plenty Happening, happening tomorrow, another way to honor the life of George Floyd through service. The San Antonio Food Bank has designated tomorrow as a day of service in the name of Floyd. Volunteers are welcome to assist the food bank in distributing food to those in need in our community. There will be a mobile pop-up distribution center set up at Trader's Village. Volunteers are needed both there and at the food bank's warehouse. The food bank stands against racism, we stand against injustice, and we want San Antonio to come together in what I think is the purest form of love, and that service. Those wishing to receive food tomorrow can pre-register on the food bank's website. We have a link to get there posted on ksat.com. It's a live video over the uh, Frost Tower downtown. Of course, the crimson and gold, the school colors of George Floyd when he went to high school in Houston on the eve of his funeral tomorrow. And it's definitely a hot day out there today. We've made it up to 97 for the high temperature, and that's five degrees above average. Now, tomorrow's going to be a little bit warmer, but that's going to be the pinnacle for the week, and then we'll see the temperatures drop a bit, but the humidity is going to take quite a blow, which is nice. All right, so let's take a look at that almanac data today. 75 closer to sunrise than 97 into the afternoon. Right now we're in the 80s. Oh, 79 in Kerrville. That's an update for you. But Rio Medina 82, Bolverde, you're 86 and Holotus now at 84 at the airport in San Antonio. Still officially at 89 degrees and hanging on to the 90s out west where we broke a record high today in Del Rio of 107, 96 degrees still at this hour and in the lower 90s as you head farther south down I-35. It's the humidity. It is thick out there. It is very muggy and sticky. I mean, look at the dew points well into the 70s, especially east of I-35. Pleasant and a dew point of 78. That is the uh, very much in the oppressive category. And tomorrow this humidity is going to be very noticeable along with some higher heat. But look what happens here. We have a little cool front that's going to pay us a visit tomorrow evening. So in the morning, yes, very sticky afternoon, still very sticky. But parts of the hill country tomorrow afternoon and early evening will start to dry out as this drier air gets pushed into town. And then we get into Tuesday night and Wednesday and poof, the humidity is pushed out of here. And actually, we're looking at a pretty dry stretch in terms of lack of mugginess in the air and a lack of humidity uh, for Wednesday through the weekend and into early next week. An abnormally long stretch of weather without real muggy conditions for this time of year. So here's our future cast, too. I want to point this out. We could see a few isolated pop up storms tomorrow afternoon and evening. Mostly sunny throughout the day. Look at 1 p.m., a lot of sunshine. Then that little cool front drops in, and with it, 
a little line of clouds and the potential for some stray pop up thunderstorms. And if we do have a storm pop up, it's not out of the question that it could become strong to severe. But really right now we're just looking at about a 20% chance of one of those storms developing. So we're not looking at anything widespread. I wish we were because it's going to be dry thereafter sunny and dry pattern. So 78 in the morning, high humidity right near 100 in the afternoon, and that means it's going to feel like it's anywhere from about 105 to 109, I think, for a few hours in the afternoon. So we do have a heat advisory for San Antonio and especially locations east of I-35 for the noon hour all the way through 7 p.m. tomorrow. Then we get rid of the humidity. It's a lot of sunshine. Mornings are definitely going to be a little bit cooler and will be running below average as a result of the lack of humidity. But we're looking at wall to wall sunshine, a very dry stretch Wednesday through the weekend into early next week. The mornings in the 60s and afternoons in the mid 90s. Well, as Adam just mentioned, the heat is here and with higher temperatures, an increase in utility bills can also be expected. Not only are we cranking up the AC, many of us are home using more power. 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz has some ways to take the shock out of your electric bill. The heat is on and so is your AC. And with more people spending more time at home, working, cooking, and cooling, that can scorch a hole in your wallet. So what can you do to chill your bills? Adjusting your thermostat settings is actually one of the simplest and most significant things you can do to keep your energy bills under control. CPS Energy recommends setting your thermostat at 78 degrees in summer. If that's too warm for you, adjusting even a couple of degrees makes a difference. A programmable thermostat can help, and a smart thermostat can actually adjust your settings based on your behavior. Some smart thermostats also offer wireless temperature sensors that detect motion in a room, and that allows you to heat or cool a room when it's only being used. If you enroll an eligible Wi-Fi thermostat in CPS Energy's rewards program, you get an $85 credit and another $30 credit each year. You can also curtail energy use by keeping AC filters clean, doors and windows sealed, ceiling fans circulating, unused chargers unplugged, and window blinds and curtains closed. It keeps the heat out and the cool in. In the kitchen, using a toaster oven or microwave costs less than heating up the big oven. And avoiding running the clothes dryer or dishwasher between three and seven, the hottest part of the day, will help you keep your cool. Marilyn Moritz, KSET 12 News. We're learning more about the coronavirus. New evidence that the virus may have hit Wuhan, China nearly three months before Chinese health officials told the world. It's coming up next on the Night Beat. As the country continues to reopen tonight, 20 states seeing an increase in new cases. The nation's deadliest hotspot, New York City, beginning to open its doors today for the first time in three months. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo cautioning residents in hopes of preventing a second spike. And new images from Wuhan, China, suggest the virus may have hit the city months before it was reported. ABC's Romina Puga has more. This week, signs that the threat from coronavirus is not over. Although 20 states report a decreasing number of new cases, 20 others in Puerto Rico are on the rise. Arizona reported a record number of 1,500 new cases just two weeks after reopening. South Carolina hospitalizations hit a new high Monday at 542, while North Carolina reported at least 739 patients in the hospital, its highest ever daily total since the start of the pandemic. This as the number of deaths surpasses 110,000 in the country. Kaiser Health News and The Guardian reported nearly 600 of the victims were U.S. healthcare workers. And more cities seek normalcy. After three months of shutdown, New York City, weathering the deadliest outbreak in the nation, now gradually reopens. Governor Cuomo warning residents to stay vigilant. Look at the reopening date and look at when, what happened after they reopened. That is the cautionary tale, my friends. You have to stay smart after the reopening, because if you don't, you can see a spike. 
and new evidence that the virus may have hit Wuhan nearly three months before Chinese health officials told the world. These satellite photos show various Wuhan hospital parking lots from October 2018 compared to 2019. The number of cars in the parking lot almost double. More cars into a, uh, to a hospital, the hospital's busier, likely because maybe something's happening in the community and infection is growing and people have to see a doctor. Researchers say they can't prove the increase is due to COVID-19, but they also found internet searches in Wuhan for the terms diarrhea and cough spiked in October, two symptoms of the coronavirus. And the New York Times reports meatpacking plants and prisons continue to drive hotspots, with 39 of the 40 largest known virus clusters in the U.S. coming from these facilities. In Colorado, Romina Puga, ABC News. All right, check this out. 200 cars joined a caravan of well-wishers in Hempstead, New York, to celebrate this year's graduating class from the Academy Charter School. 95 students each allowed two guests to watch them receive their diplomas on stage before the drive-by celebration. And the ceremony was even more special because it was the school's first graduating class. A year they won't forget, no. for sure. You're right for the heat and humidity tomorrow. The heat index, so the feels like temperature, could reach 105 to about 112 for locations along and especially east of I-35. But even around here in San Antonio, I wouldn't be surprised if we see that heat index about 105 to 109 for a few hours in the afternoon. Then we wipe away the humidity for Wednesday and it's going to stay away through the weekend. That's it for the night beat GMSA at 430. Good night.